This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Welcome into Off the Pike and welcome into our TV audience on the local angle on FanDuel TV. Joining us now from The Ringer, The Ringer Fantasy Football Show, The Ringer NFL Draft Show, puts out the great draft guide for The Ringer as well. It is Danny Kelly. Danny, thanks so much for taking some time, man. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pre- my pleasure. All right. So I wanted to start by, well, I wanted to have you on to talk about some of these young guys for the Patriots. But of course, we get the big news that Ezekiel Elliott is coming to the Patriots. And that was the <laughs> yeah. big news for the team this week. Not a lot of faith in the Kevin Harris's of the world, the PR Strong's of the world who weren't exactly impressive during training camp and their first action in preseason. But yeah. I like the Zeke thing. I mean, some of the stuff I look at, you look at the third and short numbers, one to three yards to go. 18 first downs last season. That was tied for the most in the league. He was second in touchdowns in the red zone at 12. His percentage of touchdowns rushing inside the 10 was 41.7%. That was tied for six with Jalen Hurts. So these are really good numbers. (laughs) And you kind of juxtapose him to Damian Harris. And look, the Patriots, of course, had a bad offensive line. Dallas had a good offensive line. But if you just look at something that he controls, the missed tackles force, it was last year... 30 of them for Zeke, which was 25th. Harris was at 10th, and that was or that was 58th out of 59 guys. So, and like yeah. I said, all the stuff that goes into this, the offensive line and whatnot. But I do feel like if you, the other element to this, I advocated earlier this offseason, Danny, like okay, let's just feed Ramondre 300 carries, like let's do it. But then you also look at the fact, well, what if Ramondre goes down? There wasn't a lot behind right. him, so that's certainly part of it. And the other element to me is, well, then he has doesn't have to do all the tough carries right where it's like third and one you have one of the best short yardage running backs in the NFL so I think this is a perfect fit for the Patriots yeah it makes a ton of sense I mean and this is the classic Bill Belichick move too I think just because Zeke is in a lot of ways a a coach's dream I mean he pass blocks he's really reliable he doesn't fumble Um, you know kind of a lot of the things that that you hear uh, Belichick talk about all the time just like a coach's dream type of guy who's just going to do his job you know it's a cliche but he really is that that type of player and so um. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. I think Mondre is still going to be the clear cut, you know, starter for for the Patriots. But um, having a guy like Zeke who can come in, be a little bit of insurance, and and like you said, do the dirty work on short yardage and in the goal line area. Um, it just makes a ton of sense for the Patriots. I think it's a really smart signing. Yeah, I love it. It just felt like it was a matter of time before it was going to happen. We saw him and Mac went out to dinner, so it felt like okay. <laughs> Delvin Cook and Zeke eventually are going to sign with the Patriots and the Jets. It was just a matter of time until it happened. So it's good they got him in the building and knock on wood, nothing happens to Ramondre. But you still it's a really nice one two punch for a team that's going to have to rely on their running game. Then I look at the other news we got this week, which is Mike Gusecki. He's now dealing with a shoulder injury. They're hoping to get him back for week one. But one of the things I was thinking about with Gusecki is it did really feel like and this has been going on for a few years now, Danny, the Patriots wanted to use that 12 personnel. The problem was mm. you couldn't really justify keeping John o. Smith on the field because he wasn't re- a really good player. <laughs> and you look at Kaseki, right. right? I mean, this is a guy that two years ago before he fell out of favor and it just didn't work out in Mike McDaniel's offense, second most snaps in the slot two years ago, right? So they were going to go with yep. these two tight ends. And I do feel like, all right, this is not a great receiving group that the Patriots have. 
So they probably prefer to try to go 12 personnel rather than have the three receivers on the field to try to, okay, maybe we get a scheme advantage here. So I do feel like I understand that there's hope that he's going to be back for week one, but it really is difficult now going forward to game plan or put stuff together with Mike Isecki building chemistry with Mac. Yeah. It did feel like this is the one thing that maybe they felt like they had an advantage with. And now it does feel like even though he may be ready for the start of the season, this is kind of a big blow for just putting the work in, getting ready for the season. Yeah, and he's a very unique player, you know. I mean, there's just not a lot of guys that with his length, um, his size, his speed, explosiveness, catch radius. Um, I've been a Mike Kosicki fan for a long time, actually. I thought it was kind of a bummer last year when the Dolphins didn't really utilize him very much in their offense. He was sort of an afterthought, and so I was excited to see him sign it in New England. I think, you know, it's, it seems like they had a pretty big plan for him. Um, he is, you know, a de facto receiver, I think. He's not really a tight end. Um, when yeah. you talk about like his blocking ability and things like that, but, but yeah, I think, um, you know, he has a chance to hopefully he gets back early and, and you, you know, like, isn't too long of a ramp up period to get him back into the offense. But I do think he has a uh, potential to have a pretty, pretty big role. You know, he's a big target in the middle of the field. He's a really good red zone guy in the sense that you can kind of just throw it up in his direction and he tends to come down with it. He's got, he's got some run after the catch ability. Um, if you go back to, you know, when he came out of the draft, he was one of the most, uh, athletic tight ends we've ever seen in terms of just yeah. like his jumping leaping ability. I think he's a former volleyball guy, you know, so he has a very unique skill set. And I was excited to see uh, the ways in which, you know, the Patriots could utilize that. Hopefully they'll still do that this year, even though he is injured right now. And Bill O'Brien finally gets to use him because he recruited him all the way back in the day at Penn State. They <laughs> yeah, finally reunited. Yeah. They're going to get the opportunity. So we'll see. Hopefully it's not too long, but I do feel like they're going to miss out on this time sort of building chemistry with that offense. Now, I wanted to get to Mac because you wrote back in 2020 that you would have been more excited if the Patriots had traded up to take Justin Field instead of waiting for Mac to fall in their laps at 15. I felt the same way at the time. I just feel like the upside for Fields and what yeah. we've seen recent history tells us the guys with the tools like the toolsy quarterbacks, they're hitting at a higher rate than these prototypical old school pocket passers like Mac Jones. So one of the things I look at is, OK, well, then he needs to be helped by the scheme, which last year that was the opposite, right? I mean, they had arguably right. <laughs> the worst scheme in the NFL. And you look at it last season, he had just 19 total dropbacks out of RPOs, 4.3 percent, 16 mm. completions, but minus 33 air yards, 97 total yards, right? Like they didn't have an RPO game whatsoever. Everything was behind right. the line of scrimmage. And you look at some of these other quarterbacks that came out of ba uh, Alabama, Jalen Hurts, 69 dropbacks, two of 43. And the reason I do this is because they all came from similar offenses. Right. And then I look at Bryce Young last year with Bill O'Brien, 14.2% of his dropbacks compared to Mack at, like I said, 4.3. And we know Mack at Alabama, 890 yards via RPOs. Yep. 10 touchdowns, no picks. I mean, all you have to do is look at that Notre Dame game in the semifinals where he was absolutely outstanding. But I have to imagine that this is something, and maybe with some of the concern with this offensive line that the Patriots may have, that Bill O'Brien is going to almost have to dig into this RPO game, which I think could be a blessing in disguise in some sense. Like, Mac Jones is actually good at this, and they haven't taken advantage right. of it really since he came to the NFL. Yeah, I mean, and that's the mark of a good offensive coordinator slash play caller, right? Like putting your players in position to succeed, doing what they like to do, what they're very good at and what they're comfortable doing. And so, you know, last year, just nothing really made sense with the decision-making in terms of how they ran that offense. Um, obviously you hope the hope is that they get, you know, they get back on track here with Bill O'Brien and um, you know, he, he definitely gets the most out of Mac Jones. I, it, Mac, it's funny to say because they're not similar players, but Jones kind of reminds me a little bit of Tua um, in just like, Quick processor, get the ball out, get the get it to you know your playmakers, let them do the work, and, and I think you know at his best, that's what he can be. That's the type of quarterback he can be is just like distribute the football, get the ball out, um, make the right uh, reads and right, right choices with the football, and, and you're good to go. And so, in some ways, Tua and Mac are similar. Obviously, they came from similar systems at Alabama, and so um, the hope is you know with that quick processing speed, we can see some more of that with Mac Jones this year. Where it's just like you know, hitting his back foot, getting the ball out. Yeah, and that's what we saw with Tua. You're right. Like, Tua last year was really helped by Mike McDaniel, and we'll see if Bill O'Brien yeah. can have a similar effect on the effect that Mike McDaniel had for Tua. But I wanted to get to just more on Mac. This is kind of a loaded question, but as somebody that knows these <laughs> quarterbacks coming out of the collegiate level better than anybody, you look at this, and the 
So we get the news Anthony Richardson is starting for the Colts. And then you had in that same draft Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, who we saw in the preseason game last week. And then I go back to 2022, the only first-round pick was Kenny Pickett. So out of those four guys, if you were going to bet on it in terms of having a better career, how many guys out of that group do you think Mac will have a better career then? Oh, man, that's a really good question. So you're talking about the guys from this class, last class? Yeah, and I'll throw Pickett in there from the 2022 class. So it's those four guys, like the the three first-rounders this past year and then Kenny Pickett. Yeah, it's tough because the last two classes with the quarterbacks, there's just been a lot of question marks with everybody. You know, with um, Bryce Young, it's obviously the size is a huge, huge impediment to his potential success, and he'd be an extreme outlier, you know, among all quarterbacks. And then with Stroud, it's like he's a little too robotic. And um, I would say Mac Jones is kind of on that Stroud spectrum in terms of his style. I think he's, a you know, mainly a pocket quarterback, but can kind of move around a little more athletic than you think. And so... Um, I'm still pretty bullish, honestly, on Mac Jones. I know that there's, Hmm. you know, some question marks about, I guess, like just his relationship with the team, his relationship with the coaching staff. I think there's still some uncertainty there. Um, But I think, you know, like I said, with with Mac, it's like if he gets in a system that he's comfortable in and, you know, he's getting the ball out quickly, I think he's got a really high, really high floor. Um, He might not have as high of a ceiling, I think, as um, like, for instance, Anthony Richardson. I think his ceiling is absolutely sky high. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, like I think Jones can still be a mid middle of the pack to slightly above average style quarterback. You know what I mean? Like not necessarily a guy that's going to completely elevate the offense, but a guy that can run it efficiently and, you know, distribute the football and ultimately like put together a good offense. And so, um, I think gifts wise, like he's, he's probably a little bit more gifted than, than Kenny Pickett. Um, in turn, terms of it's just his overall skill set. Um, and I think like put him right up against like Stroud in terms of just like the type of quarterback he could be. So, um, you know, I know I'm kind of sidestepping the question where, where could he end up? But I, I will say I, I'm pretty bullish on Mac Jones still. I still think he can be a really good pro. Yeah. And after 2021, I think we all felt the same way, right? It's yeah, like, okay, yeah. now it, it got a little dicey at the end of the season, but I thought he was one of the only guys that showed up him and Kendrick Bourne to that Bills playoff game. Like the rest of the Patriots did not play particularly well. And you just look at the difference and I don't think anybody thinks that Josh McDaniels is this unbelievable offensive coordinator, right? I mean, you look at all the offenses that he's had without Tom Brady, really the only other one that was successful was the one with Mac Jones. So, I mean, it just kind of tells you that like, okay, even when he just had a competent offensive coordinator, he played pretty well. So hopefully going from the worst coordinator situation in the NFL to Bill O'Brien, we see a little bit better version of what we got in 2021. So I'm glad to hear you say that you're that you're bullish on Mac because I want to have an interesting season and Mac's going to have to be a large part of that. Great stuff there from Danny Kelly as we get you ready for the Patriots season. Cannot wait for football to get underway and a lot more coming up here on the local angle. You'll hear from my buddy John Jastrzemski from New York, New York. You'll hear from the guys from the Philly special and Jason Goff from the full go in Chicago. Welcome to the Ringers Philly special and to those of you watching on FanDuel TV, welcome. Shiel Kapadia here. Just got back from Eagles, Browns, joint practices, two sessions down at the Novacare Complex in South Philly. A spirited two days and the, the man joining me today was on the sideline with me taking in all the action. He's a return guest. The fans love him. The listeners love him. E.J. Smith of the Inquirer. You, ha- you haven't said no yet. You haven't turned me down for one of these yet. That's got to be coming with, with as many times as I've, I've asked you. That's not going to happen. No, nah, I'm always excited that you, <laughs> you invite me on. Every time you invite me on, it's like, all right, I must be, I must have done pretty good the last time, you know? So, no, nah, always uh, always honored to hop on with you, Sheila. I appreciate the invite. Well, it was a, it was a fun two days. I, I like the joint practices. It's a highlight of the summer they get after it you see all right how do they look against a different team it's actually the ones playing so it's not like a preseason game so here's what ej and i are going to do we're just going to go back and forth with takeaways i don't know what his takeaways are he doesn't know what my takeaways are they could be big picture stuff they could be one specific play that stood out they could be a player a long-term thing uh whatever and we'll go back and forth basically 
until we're out of ideas uh, or until uh, EJ is going to go and watch Lionel Messi and I'm <laughs> going to go watch the Phillies uh, game tonight. I'll have Messi on another, another screen uh, as well. We'd like to see what he does against the Union. All right. Big takeaway, EJ. I'll, I'll get us started here. Eagles were a different team in the second practice compared to the first practice. I mean, that was really the story of the day. So, you know, day one was on Monday and the Browns were getting after the Eagles. I mean, Eagles offensively, they couldn't do anything. They were kind of scrambling. Now, Browns defensive line, I thought, really dominated. Jalen Hurts looks incredible to me, uh, <laughs> like passing the football. I mean, I've, I've been to four practices. I was at the two uh, this week, and I'm just like, I'm wondering, like, you know, you, I've been spending so much time going, all right, where's this team going to regress? That's generally, you know, when you make the Super Bowl, a lot of things go your way. Injuries, turn it. We, we know all the things uh, we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about. But he just had some plays. Like, even in the first practice where I said the Browns defense got the better of the Eagles offense, like, Hurts had a couple throws where he's rolling to his right. And in a real game, maybe it's a sack, but they didn't blow the whistle. And he's just firing the ball downfield to Devontae Smith while rolling to his right where Devontae Smith is at the sideline on a scramble drill, uh, kind of toe-tapping. And the ball just lands right in his hands for a beautiful uh, completion. And just his his accuracy here the last two days has been so impressive. I mean, he had a scramble drill today where he's pointing to A.J. Brown on the right side in kind of the corner of the end zone and just chucks it up for a jump ball. But again, it's in a place where only A.J. Brown can catch it. Like, I think in two days, I only saw one pass that I would say was off target. Uh, Devontae Smith had kind of a go ball down the right sideline on Monday that I thought hurt, hurt kind of under through. And I can't remember if it ended up being an interception or an incompletion, but... Uh, it just feel like feels like he's taking a step up in that regard. And I was looking at his numbers. Year one, he only starts four games and he completes fifty two percent of his passes. Year two, his first year as a full time starter, he completes sixty one percent of his passes. Year three, uh, he's second in MVP voting. He completes sixty six point five percent of his passes. Like think of the leap in those numbers. And I was just like, man, if I was doing if we're doing like a bold predictions episode. Like, could Jalen Hurts lead the NFL in completion percentage? I mean, last year, the leader was Geno Smith at 69.8%, and Jalen Hurts was 66.5% last year, and he's 25 years old. You know, he's thrown a slant to A.J. Brown uh, in the red zone. He finds Devontae Smith on a touchdown on an RPO. Uh, I'm just really impressed with what he's looked like in the sessions I've gone to. As someone who's been to every practice, uh, sometimes it's boring because you're just like, you know, I, I know, especially when you're on the beat, you're looking for all different kinds of stories. But this is just the big picture. Like, how has Jalen Hurts looked to you? Does he look any different than he's looked um, in previous camps or even last season? He looks much different than previous camps, in my opinion. Like what you're okay. saying, I, I completely agree with. This is why this is why you're you, Shield, because like you can only go to four practices and you just you get your <laughs> finger on the pulse. You know, hats Listen, off to you for that. that yeah, <laughs> that's the national reporter move. Back in, back yeah. in the day, it was hilarious. Guys would just come in for one day and then they would write a whole column about some. Uh, the, the famous one is uh, Ifanye Moma. For those yeah. longtime <laughs> listeners, you'll remember that that he was going to be some kind of star because someone came in and popped in for a day. So I always try to be a little hesitant when I do that, but that's why I could throw yeah. the question your way. If you if you came in on the right day, you. You, like a couple years ago, you would think J.J. Ortega Whiteside was going to be like, you know, the next yeah. uh, Calvin Johnson or something, <laughs> you know. Or Zegatron. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> he, had, he had a couple <laughs> days there. Um, but no, I, I think you're hitting it right on the head. Like, you know, Jalen has, I didn't think he was a particularly good practice player in his first few years. Like, you know, and I had to keep in mind, like so much of his game is the out of, you know, out, like out of structure, you know, off schedule stuff. This year, he's been like, surgical you know like I'm, i don't want to you know throw around like hyperbolic words but like you know i think he has looked like an mvp candidate you know which again like he usually looks like that in the game but in the pra in practice sessions you know sometimes it loses some of that i think where he's at now you know so much of his game does translate to these settings where you know he's so much more you know polished in the pocket he's such he's so advanced as a processor and i think like you know he talked up early in camp about like the quote-unquote new chemistry he wants to build uh, with AJ Brown. And it's like, you guys were really good last year. I don't really know if there's another step there, but honestly, like you mentioned that fade route today, like that was like, you know, it's an unguardable play. 
you know, 40, it's like a 30 yard completion in the, in the back of the end zone. And there's nothing you can do about it, you know? And like, you know, that's the type of thing I think that they have really worked on is like some of these back shoulder throws, some of these like really well-placed fade routes. It's like, you can't touch it, you know, like there's literally nothing you can do. Uh, and I've seen that throughout camp, you know, to the point where them struggling against the Browns, you know, Jalen, uh, after practice kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know the word, I don't know, well, you know, the word for it, but like, he was kind of like, listen, it's kind of tricky when the standard's so high because you played so well that, you know, you have one bad day and everybody kind of thinks that it's a big deal. And, you know, like, I do think, you know, we take these practices for what they are, you know, we kind of, um, you know, they struggled the first day. It's fair to point that out. But at the same yeah. time, like, he's right. He had had like four or five days where he had been really, really sharp. He had one practice where it was a little off. And, you know, I don't think anybody was sounding alarm bells or anything like that. But, you know, he really has been – he's gotten to a point where that practice he had yesterday was a little bit surprising because of, you know, how sharp they've been. I mean, you know, especially like I think the Browns – like you said, the Browns defensive front kind of wrecked the, wrecked the practice yesterday – um, Miles Garrett didn't practice today, which might have been <laughs> a big reason why things were, you know, were a little bit Good easier point. to. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like there are just plays every practice where it's like it didn't matter what they call it, what the defense called. It didn't matter what kind of guys they had out there like Jalen Hurts to A.J. Brown or Jalen Hurts to Devontae Smith or Jalen Hurts rolling out and finding Dallas Goddard. It's on. It's can. It is unguardable when they're at their best. And, you know, that's why I think, you know, this offense is going to be you know, one of the best offenses again in the league is because, you know, to see Jalen Hurts not only come into camp, even if he didn't have a solid camp, I'd be like, well, what he showed us in games is enough for us to think he's going to be that, you know, be the guy he was last year. He's been better. You know, he has been, he has really picked up where he left off. So no, I mean, I, like I said, you hit it right on the head. I mean, just like the processing, uh, the accuracy, and just again, like developing these like go-tos with, uh, with the receivers, you know, especially AJ Brown, where it's like, you know what, if it's a third and 10 and I got to have it, I can put it in a place where nobody else can get it to A.J. Brown. You know, like last year, I felt like it was the A.J. Brown slant route. You know, they just spam that. Third and four, third and five, A.J. Brown slant route. We, we know it's going to work. It works every time. It's almost like that you know what's coming and it doesn't matter because you can't guard it. Now, like, I think they're adding this fade route to it. And I think, again, like they really are. The, the, they've, they've had some back shoulder throws this, this camp where it's like, man, I feel bad for James Bradbury. Like, you know, it's like you did everything right and you just gave up a 25-yard completion. So, yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. Like, the, the way Jalen has looked has been really impressive, especially because, again, I, I didn't think he was necessarily the type of guy that, you know, you had to measure his performance in practice. You know, again, he wasn't always that guy for me. Exactly. If, if Hertz had a terrible training camp, I'd be telling everyone to calm down. Like, did you not yeah. watch the, him on the field when the games mattered? last year and so now you have that but he also looks you know sharper than he ever has in practice it makes kind of the possibilities exciting uh if you're an eagles fan for this season and you're you're so right those back shoulder throws like that really wasn't a big part of what they yeah. did but even the preseason game i mean tanner mckee i i joked aaron Rodgers and tanner mckee the two best back shoulder uh passers uh in nfl history <laughs> so uh, so that seems to be something they're adding to their uh arsenal we saw with jalen hurts today and you're right i mean i, I remember when i was in seattle just you know like asking Richard Sherman and there it's just like that it that truly is an unguardable uh play if if you have it in your arsenal it requires timing and chemistry between the quarterback and the receiver but if you have it there's literally nothing the corner like corners that's the one thing they'll admit like there's nothing we can do uh on that play if the quarterback and receiver have that so that's something yeah. to certainly keep an eye on uh let's take a little break to those watching on FanDuel TV remember you can catch the Ringers Philly special on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. To those of listening to us right now, we'll take a break and we'll be right back. All right, welcome into episode 277 of the Full Go Podcast, brought to you by The Ringer, of course. Spotify is the gang. I'm Jason Goff, and this is The Local Angle. Shout out to all of our FanDuel TV people. Of course, we come at you every Sunday, every Tuesday, and every Thursday. And, of course, when there's an emergency pod necessary, we do that as well, because those are the type of folks we are. Um, I want to start, well, y'all, by, y'all should know by now, anytime I start, with love, that means it's about to get bad. Uh, I want to start with my love and admiration for what Luis Robert Jr. has become 
as a baseball player and an entity in this city of Chicago. I am looking forward to this man rake for years to come. He is already playing gold glove caliber center field. Uh, he has ironed out some of the mistakes of his game in terms of hustling and some of the things that we talked about earlier on in the season, right? Like, you, you, you love to jump on the bandwagon, oh, show these players, bitch them when they don't hustle, or you, you, you better bust your ass down the line every time for me, and then when they start doing it, we don't say anything. Because it's supposed to be that way, right? It's their job. But he's going above and beyond his job this year. And the Crosstown series – some of the luster has worn off of it over the years, obviously with interleague play and now everybody playing everybody. Like I don't even look at AL or NL home run leaders anymore. I just go ahead. Give me the whole, give me the whole kit and caboodle major league baseball. And when you take a look at major league baseball's home run leaders, who do you see at the very top, right? You get Matt Olson in there, you get Shohei Otani and and I ain't mad at you. Shohei rest, everything you need to rest. You're about to be a half a billion dollars richer. You know, if if that arm ain't feeling good or he, he messed around, didn't pitch, came up to bat, hit a home run. And it was like, oh, Shohei Otani is doing it halfway decent. They treating him bad now. He wanted to get that ERA under three, right? He really wanted to stun on y'all. He was like, ah, second MVP in a row, you know, making my man Mickey Mantle behind me and Mike Trout look like a bumpkin. You feel me? Like Shohei Otani's really out here balling. And we are mentioning Luis Robert Jr. in that pantheon in that category in terms of home run hitters this year because i don't know if y'all was been watching but coming into this this game and this is before he did what he did against the chicago white Sox, hit his 32nd home run of the season but fourth in major league baseball but coming into this game i want, I want y'all to know something about what Luis robert jr has become this season hasn't all been lost and i'm gonna get to the hate at some point here don't you worry but this is what he's done He's second in the AL in home runs. He's third in doubles. He's second in slugging percentage. He's fifth in runs scored. And he's third in wins above replacement. This is a bona fide star that we have here on the south side. He's the first White Sox center fielder to ever hit 30 or more home runs. First one selected to an all-star game since Chet Lemon, ladies and gentlemen. Seventh season with 30-plus home runs and 15-plus stolen bases in White Sox history. The size, the speed, the power, the precision. Seasons like this don't get put together very often on the south side. 27th season with 30-plus home runs and 30-plus doubles. This has only been done 26 previous times. And Frank Thomas is a lot of those times for Chicago White Sox fans who are feeling a little nostalgic. All right. Love's out the way. This is where the hate comes in. If I'm Pedro Grifo and this was any other organization, I know I'd be one and done. Because before the Cubs-White Sox game, Luis Robert with his interpreter at his locker, you know, got the got the cross earring dangling, LT style. Shout out to Lawrence Taylor back in the 80s, Googles. You know, do you Googles out there, kids? But he's got the... You know, he's got the pump, the, 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 the faux hawk with the, with the blonde patch on the left side. Looking every bit as swaggy as we remember when we were introduced to this dude four years back when he was sitting at his mama's dinner table with, with, the, with the plastic, you know, tabletop with, with no shirt on, three chains and some baseball pants. This is how we literally were introduced to Luis Robert Jr., and now he's come so far. He's an all-star. He's going to be a perennial all-star. The power stroke is here and here to stay because he's actually hitting things inside the strike zone. He shrunk the strike zone, which is something that we didn't think he would be able to do consistently enough. He's doing that this year. This is why I say if I were Pedro Grifo, I would be thanking my lucky stars that I am managing for Jerry Reinsdorf, Kenny Williams, and Rick Hahn. Because before... The Cubs-White Sox game, the game in which the Cubs arrived five games over 500 and a game where the White Sox arrived 25 games under 500. Luis Robert Jr. was asked by the assembled media, Scott Merkin and the folks. I think I heard Scott's voice in there. Shout out to Scotty M out there. I think I heard Scott's voice on the, on the, the follow-up question. He was asked about being a leader. And Luis Robert Jr. said, I am no leader. And I got no problem. Everybody wants to hear their players say, I'm a leader. I'm the guy that's going to take the bull by the horn. Self-inventory is key. Self-awareness is optimal. 
This man understands that he is nobody's leader. And you know how you lead? Doing your goddamn job. And he's done his job every single day, outside of a couple where he didn't bust his hump up the line or he lollygagged it in the center field in the first month of the season. We remember it, right? And it's noted, but four and a half, five months later, this dude is playing like an MVP candidate. So for him to say, I'm no leader, I got no problem with that. I got no problem. Maybe he hasn't found his voice or, or... (laughs) Maybe we just need dudes to do their jobs and and the leaders just arise. Now, the problem is where I have the second question that was asked of Luis Robert Jr. He he was asked, who are the leaders in this clubhouse? And this is something that has been thrown around since the Keenan Middleton story got thrown out there by Jesse Rogers. Shout out to Jesse for doing fabulous reporting. Right, Lance Lynn goes to the Dodgers. Next thing you know, he's on a podcast and is asked to speak about the Keenan Middleton comments. And he says, and I quote, This is what I disagree with when it came to Keenan Middleton and paused for six seconds so that it was clear that there was nothing that he was disagreeing with with what Keenan Middleton had to say. Then you find out that, hey, maybe the pitchers, the pitching staff shouldn't be the leaders of your group because eh, they're pitching every fifth day. You're not really, you know, they're quiet on the days they're not pitching. When they are pitching, you don't mess with them. Maybe just maybe a position player should be your leader. So when he's asked the rebuttal, The follow-up, the retort of, okay, since you're not the dude, who is the leader in this clubhouse? And you know what Luis Robert Jr. looked into a camera and smilingly said? No say. That's it. That's it. Simple as that. If you don't speak Spanish, you speak that much. I don't know. And after everything that's happened this season, The Tim Anderson situation, the embarrassment that the Mike Clevenger situation was at the beginning of the season that we've kind of forgotten about so far. Yasmani Grandal and the reports coming out about Tim Anderson and Yasmani mixing it up, whether that's true or not. Yasmani Grandal having to answer for Keenan Middleton and some of the comments that have been made about him not really working with the pitching staff, which is, I'd say, substandard. For the catcher that you signed to the biggest deal in free agent history in White Sox organizational, um, uh, you know, history. So what are we talking about here? Huh? You got the best player on the team saying, I don't know who the leader is and don't look at me because <laughs> that's not my style and I'm not mad at him. He is paid to do everything that he has done this year. Some grown <laughs> men in that clubhouse. A 24 year old ain't supposed to be the leader. And if he is, then he's either exceptional or your organization and franchise. Both can be the case, though. Both can be true in this situation. Meanwhile, you have the Cubs out here trying to piecemeal a bullpen together. Kyle Hendricks getting yakitiled in the beginning of that game and everything kind of slowed down. Shout out to Tugi Tucson. The man got a lot of, lot of, lot of stuff. He just don't know where it's going all the time. And, and I saw that in Atlanta when he touched earth, right? When he touched down in Major League Baseball, it wasn't a, a, a fact of whether or not Tukey Tucson had the stuff. It was the command. So in the beginning of this game tonight, and where the Sox win the second game and look, looking forward to the sweep the next day, it ain't the game that matters in the long run. Is what's being said and not said about this culture, this clubhouse, and the powers that be on the south side. If Pedro Grifo was anybody else, let's say Pedro Grifo was three seasons deep, this would be a fireable offense type of season. And you might say, oh, Jay, what is he not doing right? Guess what? All I heard in, tr- in spring training was that they were going to do things differently. And the fight and the fundamentals that these dudes did not show up with for the previous year, it was going to be different. Fast forward to the trade deadline where a, a long reliever, a, a setup guy, a relief pitcher. You know, these sometimes are the kickers and punters on these baseball teams, right? Out of sight, out of mind. Are you getting people out or are you out here throwing more gas on the fire? A relief pitcher who was here for a cup of coffee said what he had to say and everybody fell in line in terms of, uh, you know, he ain't wrong. They talking about you, Pedro. You have not established a leadership hierarchy. You Maybe you're being questioned as a leader. Ozzie Guillen questions it multiple times a broadcast over the last month. So as the calendar turns from August 
to September and this Sox season getting ready to be over, every time out. It, once a series, there is something that over the last couple of months that has come from the White Sox side of things that has been disheartening, uncomfortable, or flat out embarrassing. All three of those things occurred shortly before they got their win against the Chicago Cubs tonight on the north side. All three of those things. It's disheartening. It's embarrassing. It's miserable. When a 24-year-old can look into a – I think he's 24, right? You know, don't quote me on that. But when a, when a dude in his early 20s who is on an MVP type of run in terms of his season can look at a camera and sheepishly grin and say, I don't know who the leaders are. Tim Anderson is out this game with neck stiffness. Like, man, fast forward me to the end of this White Sox season so I can see all the people who won't be held to account for how they perform this season. Fast forward me to the offseason when Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams are back angrier than ever and letting people know that this won't happen again, not on their watch. Meanwhile, their superstar center fielder, who is not media trained, Answering questions from the heart, honestly, divulging information about a clubhouse that we know is rotten to the core. When he is asked, who is the leader in this clubhouse? This man looked squarely into a camera, smiled, and said, no say. Well, guess what? White Sox fans, huddle around the, 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 the speakers, huddle around your AirPods, your phone, huddle around FanDuel TV. Shout out to the local angle. Guess what, White Sox fans? If you're asking me about my interest in this team going forward, I'm with Lewis Robert. No say. <laughs> no say it is. You can catch us Sundays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, whenever any news drops, considering the time that we have to work around, right? This is the, the full go. We hang out, have a good time here. Hopefully you're having a good time here with the local angle. FanDuel TV, we love you. Make sure you check us out. And, uh, you know, tell the people about this thing. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Welcome back to the local angle right here on FanDuel TV. I'm John Zyszewski, the host of New York, New York, as we move closer and closer to the start of this NFL season and the New York Jets, who already in many ways have kind of emerged here as the big winner of the offseason because of the fact that they acquired a four-time MVP, they acquired a Super Bowl champ, they now have hard knocks, they have all the buzz across the board in the NFL with Aaron Rodgers as their starting quarterback. Showed you earlier this week, they are not done in constructing their team as they go and get Dalvin Cook, who had been sitting out there in free agency, waiting to go and find himself a new home. And I, I think many of you were aware of the fact that even though I host the New York, New York podcast, and I'm a New Yorker through and through, see that guy behind me? I'm a Miami Dolphins guy. So I figured Dalvin Cook posting pictures on Instagram, a hard rock stadium, Miami and living in the state of Florida, no state income tax. That's a beautiful thing. We all know that. The idea of going back home, I was like, all right, Dalvin Cook's push coming to shove, going to find his way to South Florida. Doesn't happen. He ends up with the New York Jets. And if you're a Jet fan, happy about this move, and you should be. I cannot believe that there actually are a good amount of Jet fans in my life who weren't particularly thrilled about Dalvin Cook coming. They're like, oh, I don't want to know running back. I don't want a super team, blah, 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 blah. Hold on a second now. Let's, let's take this back a minute. Your quarterback, about three weeks ago, or two weeks ago, whatever the time period was, restructured his contract so that the Jets would have more money to go and make moves like this. It's the summertime. This is not the free agency period where, yes, we all understand in theory, the Jets' major weakness is not the running back. Room. The Jets' major weakness and what's really going to make or break how successful year one of the Rodgers-Jets partnership is going to be, 
boils down to that offensive line and how that offensive line is going to hold up and how they're going to gel over the course of the 17-game season. That's very true. There are not elite-level offensive linemen that you can pluck onto your NFL roster in mid-August. Doesn't happen. What the Jets do need, though, is someone that can take some of the pressure off of that line and off of the quarterback. And Dalvin Cook is the perfect guy at this stage in his career to do exactly that. Does he have the same burst that he did, I don't know, three or four years ago with the Minnesota Vikings? Probably not. Did last season show you he can still be a very productive and a very effective and a top level, top 10 numbers indicated such, running back in the league? You can best believe it. And we all love Brees Hall around here. I know you fantasy owners, if you had him in the first five weeks of your fantasy season, you probably love Brees Hall. I mean, how could you not? Guy's catching the ball, he's running it, he's super fast, the whole deal. Brees Hall's coming off a torn ACL. That happened in October last year against the Denver Broncos. Do you know what Brees Hall is going to look like over the course of this year? He might be great. He might not be ready. He might be somewhere in between. We don't know. There is a lot of variable. It's a lot of question for how a running back or any player for that matter is going to come back, especially at that position, off a torn ACL. Jets are in it to win it this year. This is, to me, the best case scenario for getting a guy like Brees Hall cooking later on in this year when you're going to need him. The Jets, if they're wise and if they're smart, yeah, you get him back on a practice field. Yeah, you get him running around a little bit. But the minute you get Dalvin Cook into camp, when you're playing week one against the Buffalo Bills, it's simple. Dalvin Cook's your bell cow back. He is going to get, if I'm running the team, a bulk of the carries, a bulk of the snaps, at least in the early going of this year. That way, if you draw it up and you play it right if you're the Jets, Cook is really taking a bulk of the work early in the year, and then you kind of have that ace in the hole. You build and brace Hall back. You build and brace Hall back. And maybe he comes back in September and has the same burst. Who knows? I'm not a doctor. We don't know how the ACLs play out. But you know what? I think the odds of slowly building him back and then all of a sudden accelerating him through, that could be a major game changer. And that could be a pair of fresh legs that's ready for you in November, in December. And if you're dreaming big, if you're a New York Jeff fan, in the month of January, well, look, you have to be able to, in cold weather, on the road, to close out a game, you got to lead in the fourth quarter. Yeah, the identity of your offense is always going to be Aaron Rodgers. He's the quarterback. He's a four-time MVP. It's a quarterback-driven league. We all know that. But the importance of having a monster running game, that win-you game, that four-minute offense, making sure a guy like, I don't know, Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow or Josh Allen or the Dolphin offense or uh, Baltimore's offense, a lot of a lot of really good teams in the AFC, right? You got that lead late. No matter how much trust you may have in that pass rush and that defense, you don't want the other team getting the ball back. You want those guys to be able to go and seal the deal. So this move makes perfect sense from a Jets standpoint. Now, we spend a lot of time looking at the odds. And in case you're wondering, on FanDuel as we sit here, middle of August, getting ready for the start of the year, I was curious to see. Okay, Dalvin Cook, good move for the Jets. Smart move for the Jets. Does it change their odds to win the Super Bowl? Does it change their odds to win the AFC? Does it change their odds to go and win the division in the AFC East? According to the odds makers, no, no, and no. Interesting. I thought maybe you'd see 
that division odd move a little more in their favor. Jets currently at plus 250 to win the AFC East, and they're ahead of the Miami Dolphins by a smidge. Buffalo, who has won the division since 2020, they're like a slight plus 140, 150 favorite. And I think that's justifiable. I really do. I think the Bills, because of what they've done over the last three years, and you take into account the quarterback, Josh Allen is the most talented quarterback in the AFC East. And he's in the prime of his career. We know that about him. Aaron Rodgers, as brilliant as he was two years ago, is still a guy who's pushing 40. I think having Buffalo number one as far as the division odds is justifiable and legitimate. But it also goes to show you that when it comes to the odds makers and when it comes to setting the feeling, the mood, the vibe, that has already been taken into account with the New York Jets with or without Dalvin Cook. Look, you go through the odds, and I'm going to go through it right now just to uh, humor you for a second, to win a Super Bowl. Vegas and our friends over at FanDuel are already valuing the New York Jets as one of those legitimate, bona fide championship contenders. And this is a Jet team that, remember, has not been to the playoffs in over a decade. This is a Jet team that has not won a playoff game in over a decade. See, for those wondering, okay, why haven't the Jets odds moved? FanDuel's already got them at 18-1 to to win the Super Bowl. The only teams ahead of the New York Jets, because Baltimore is right there with them at 18-1. to The Cowboys in a much weaker conference are at 13-1. The San Francisco 49ers, who have been in the NFC Championship game each of the last three years, they're at 10-1. to Cincinnati is at 10-1. to Buffalo is at 10-1. to And then... Kansas City and Philadelphia, the two teams that were playing in Glendale, Arizona last year, six to one, eight to one, respectively. How much lower can you make the Jet Super Bowl odds? They're fairly priced. That market moved not with Dalvin Cook. That market moved with Aaron Rodgers. And you saw it throughout March. All of a sudden, the Jets are like, 30 to 1. Then it was like 25 to 1. Then it was like 20 to 1. And then kind of settled in at like that 16 to 18 to 1 range. Walking around town. And it's obvious. And I think it speaks to a couple of different things here. Where we're at in New York, as far as this build up, this lead up, this anticipation to this football season, combined with the baseball teams just being in the absolute gutter. I can't think of a football season in this city that has been more highly anticipated than this one, probably going all the way back, ironically enough, to 2008. Yeah, 2008. The reason I would say 2008, the Giants were coming off the improbable Super Bowl win over the New England Patriots. The Jets went in the offseason and brought a guy by the name of Brett Favre. And that happened in, like, late July. Now it's Aaron Rodgers. It's hard knocks. The Giants are coming off a playoff appearance. Vibes are quite good in New York City for football. But Dalvin Cook, a move that helps the 2023 New York Jets. The idea that it changed anything as far as pushing them over the top, the odds makers, and I agree with them because I was high on the Jets to begin with going into the year. Not moving the needle much. Take that for what it's worth. 18-1 to 1 if you're thinking about the New York Jets to go and win the Super Bowl. This is New York, New York. I'm John Jastrzemski. We'll be back next week, and we'll start dishing out our plays for both the Giants and the Jets. Are they both going to be playoff teams? I haven't had the Jets and the Giants in the playoffs together since 2006, January of 2007. Think about that. We'll see you next week. 